What's up, folks? Hope things are going well. I'm sporting my Ace Ventura Wolverine hairstyle I'm trying to work on. During the COVID times, you could do whatever you want if you're just hanging inside and not going out in public. So I've been uh, doing that. But I wanted to talk today about my contribution to the newest edition of the Cognitive Neurosciences textbook. This is the definitive textbook on the field of cognitive neuroscience. It comes out every five years, and um, I was fortunate to be able to be accepted to what they call uh, Brain Camp, which is the Summer Institute in Cognitive Neuroscience. And every five years, they get together, and the students, like myself, we hear talks by everybody who's writing a chapter in the book. And then we write our own chapter. And so that's what we did. And I'm going to talk about my contribution. Spoiler alert. I'll tell you what it is. My contribution to the latest edition of the Cognitive Neurosciences textbook is to eliminate the hatred of old white men. That's my primary contribution. Now let's take a look at this chapter. So it is called, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of people that um, are on this chapter, a bunch of people that were working on it. It's called Toward a Socially Responsible, Transparent, and Reproducible Cognitive Neuroscience. The abstract begins, as members of the next generation of leaders, we aim to promote an ethical, inclusive, humanistic, and curiosity-driven code of conduct within cognitive neuroscience. We critically examine the current state of the field and discuss issues that remain to be addressed. In particular, we highlight the need for cultural change within the field, including a greater focus on integrity and accountability, i.e. addressing sexual harassment as well as promoting diversity. So two sort of main things that we're highlighting here in this initial section. Issues with sexual harassment kind of bundled in with issues of discrimination and issues of potential bias, but mostly the lack of diversity is what we're calling out here. Um, later on, the abstract ends, this chapter presents a call to action not only to further scientific improvements, but also to address biases and behaviors that have the potential to hinder scientific advancements. So the goal of the current chapter is to address critical issues that limit progress in our field. Scientific progress depends not only on methodological and conceptual improvements, but also on the ethical conduct in science. Therefore, before addressing methodological, methodological issues, we first discuss two cultural barriers that have impeded the inclusivity of scientific training and contribution. In particularly, we highlight the prevalence of sexual harassment and the pervasive lack of diversity. So integrity and accountability, this is where it begins. And so we have this a sentence here. Several features inherent to our academic community contribute to an environment where sexual misconduct has become normalized. These include, number one, male-dominated work settings. Now this is as close as we got. There was an original wording that talked about the prominence of old white men in academia. And I, when I first saw that written in this document, I thought, um, well, like, um, that's wrong. We shouldn't be saying that. We shouldn't be highlighting people. We shouldn't be hating on old white men. I think that there's a lot of people who who aren't really confronted when they do that. It surprises me. It surprises me sometimes how people can get away with uh, just saying that when it seems blatantly like something that you shouldn't be saying. But when I saw that, I thought, okay, how am I going to respond to that? I could say exactly what I just said. But my first thing was to look up the stats. So I went and tried to determine how many of people in academia, and then there's the question of how many people in psychology, and so on, the different fields, what's the proportion of males and females, and what's the proportion of white people and non-white people. And then I began to think, 
what do we mean by white people? Is this American white people? Or do we also include just generally, are we just looking at people's skin color? So are we also including Russians and Italians and British people? Are these all the same type of people? And then that, that's the case where if are we going to look worldwide at the age and gender and skin color of scientific researchers? Uh, because then I don't think that the I would question the notion of it being dominated by old white men at that point, of course, because you have to consider the size of China, the size of India. Um, it's obviously that's not the case there. So basically, when you begin to look into all these questions and try to understand the statistics of whether that statement would be correct or not, you just go in down these absurd questions. You know, one of the things that we did in this chapter is we talked about how the authors of this chapter were balanced by gender. Um, and so, and then we talked about the notion that the people that wrote the, all of the chapters within this textbook were balanced by gender. Now, um, I actually did that calculation so, I mean, I don't know whoever originally wrote it, if they actually looked or not, or I don't remember the details, but I actually had to, I actually went through and I looked at every single person that contributed to the chapter and noted their gender. And it's just ridiculous. These, the emphasis that people have on these things. And I'm sitting there actually looking at this based on people's genitalia, basically, my assumption of what their genitalia is. And marking, uh, you know, an X underneath whatever it is, and then calculating in the sum. And the fact that we're sitting here doing that is a bit ridiculous, in my opinion. So, um, you can thank me for the 2020 textbook on the field of cognitive neuroscience. The fact that it does not hate on old white men specifically, you can thank me for that. That's my contribution. So um, the notion that male-dominated work settings contribute to an environment of sexual misconduct, um, that's, it's probably reasonable that uh, men contribute more sexual misconduct than women, and so having a male-dominated work setting most likely is related to instances of greater sexual misconduct compared to a female-dominated work setting, I suppose. Um, but of course, it's not just about male dominated, it's, it's about biases. Like it's okay if something is dominated by one gender over the other. The issue is whether there were biases so that a certain group was not restricted from joining them. And that's what's important to be specific about this type of stuff. Hierarchical power structures um, contribute to an environment so the notion is that hierarchical power structures contribute to an environment where sexual misconduct has become normalized. And this is absolutely, I can see the truth of this statement. Um, hierarchy is, what well, there's issues of sexual harassment and um, sexual, there's issues of sexual harassment. I'm trying to think of the right word, but we'll say sexual harassment because I'm not, you know, fully versed. I'm not fully an expert on this, but... There's certainly issues of sexual misconduct and harassment in academia. And when men in positions of power are doing this, the university structure is not incentivized to enforce if these people are bringing in a lot of money. So the notion that they won't want to believe the, the person who's accusing them and the notion that they don't want to enforce these rules is very real because the university wants their money and that's the power that they have and that's where the hierarchy is important. However, there's this general notion that hierarchies are bad and that's not the case. And so I think that some of this sort of desire to remove hierarchies is absurd. I think you, you need hierarchies in order to manage things and make things happen. People need to have designated roles and hierarchies are naturally going to emerge. And I actually uh, put that in this chapter somewhere um, at the bottom. Maybe I could find that piece. 
Yeah. So at the bottom, one of the, the parts I contributed was related to artificial intelligence and sort of robots and humans and the differences between them. Um, and I said, we need to consider how neural processing is shaped by evolutionary pressures to socially evaluate individuals along multiple complex dimensions, e.g., um, for example, social hierarchies. Resulting biases shape our interpersonal interactions, which in turn form many abstract concepts like religion, philosophy, morality, and government. Um, and so I'm just kind of uh, alluding to the complexity of human culture here, and hierarchy is, an, is a part of that. So going back, we're talking about features inherent in our academic community that contribute to an environment of sexual misconduct being normalized. Um, number three, Institutional tolerance of sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination. Um, I've talked about ins I've already talked about institutional tolerance of sexual harassment. Gender-based discrimination is obviously an issue that we would want to be addressed, and we would not want anybody to be discriminated based on their gender. Uh, focus on protecting the liability of institutions. That's number four, and I already alluded to that. There's these institutions that are trying to protect themselves, and uh, so that's the power structure of trying to actually enforce these people who have sexually harassed or done sexual misconduct. That's the issue there. Um, lack of informed and proactive leadership. Okay. Um, going on. The first steps toward this goal include informing the community, changing institutional policies, here we cite uh, Malnick 2018 and um, redefining scientific integrity to include gender-based issues and reinforcing accountability at all levels. One of my concerns when we were writing this section of the chapter was the inability to make concrete recommendations. I mean, um, there was definitely some parts where I thought there was just a lot of words thrown out without sort of careful thought about what the words mean and the notion that you know, these are complex issues and solving them is actually really difficult. So um, I did include in this sentence a reference to a book about Title IX. And the reason I said the first step toward this goal include informing the community and changing institutional policies. And what I was slipping in this book about the dangers of Title IX, this citation, is not a proper way to cite something, but I just wanted to direct people to this notion. I felt like it's not, it was not fully appreciated by everybody that there's unintended consequences. You can't simply create a government body within an institution or some policy and expect that the change that you want to happen is going to happen. It's not that simple often. And often these policies actually have the opposite effect that you intend. And this is just something that's fascinating to me because I think that we often think that the uh, intuitive, we often get easily convinced of simple explanations for thing and things, and often the reality is much more complicated than that. And the, the whole thing about Title IX is that it just become this overrun bureaucratic institution that holds a lot of power now. Um, and it is beyond its original intent. Its original stated purpose is very valid, you know, removing discrimination between men and women. And that's obviously a great goal. But the in practice growth of these bureaucratic institutions over time and how they change. You know, I had a somebody who experienced the, this issue is that she was a female professor trying to get Title IX protection from her university about um, harassment from a male student who had clearly had a psychological issue, a mental health issue. And Title IX was so focused on protecting the student and avoiding the liability of the student using Title IX against her that they were not willing to provide protection against her, which included death threats from the student. So they were, they did not have their goals oriented appropriately in this instance. Um, they were just heavily cautious about the student suing the university, I guess. <sighs> 
So scrolling down, um, call to action. So at the very, we end this section with, we caution against the unfair enforcement of policies based on individuals' institutional influence or demographics, for example, race and gender. Um, and against creating discretionary internal committees. Hold on, I'm going to feel like I need to really think about each step of this these sentence here. We caution against the unfair enforcement of policies based on individuals' institutional influence or demographics and against creating discretionary internal committees in lieu of transparently and publicly acknowledging issues that affect the quality and integrity of science. Okay, so I do see what they're saying is we're cautioning against unfair enforcement of policies based on institutional influence. So again, if you do sexual misconduct, the rules should be enforced against you regardless of your power, uh, is what they're saying. And against creating discretionary internal committees in lieu of transparently and publicly acknowledging issues that affect the quality and integrity of science. We caution against creating discretionary internal committees in lieu of... Okay, so first you have to publicly acknowledge issues that affect the quality and integrity of science, and then you can make discretionary internal committees. I think is what that's saying. Bystanders, potential aggressors, and those benefiting from societal privilege should accept personal responsibility to educate themselves on these issues. And uh, to me, I think the caution that I have reading these, this snippet is what is actually going to be effective like is this actually going to be effective at all like simply telling bystanders potential aggressors and what does potential aggressor even mean somebody who has has the potential to sexually harass somebody but hasn't yet and those benefiting from privilege should accept personal responsibility to educate themselves on these issues so basically, they need to educate yourself of your privilege, I suppose, is the thing there. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure what the actual outcome is anticipated from that. Um, we could be doing, this is an opportunity for us to do the educating in this chapter, in some sense. Um, but anyway, so I think um, I wrote a few paragraphs later on in the chapter, and uh, I liked them. It was kind of wishy-washy, hippie stuff, kind of like all-encompassing brain, body, cultural stuff that I was really interested. Because I saw this book chapter as an opportunity to say, here's what people are talking about, and here's what's missing from what they're talking about. Here's what they're not talking about, and I want to mention that. And I think in some sense, I might have taken this chapter much more seriously than others because of what I just said. I don't know if other people were poring over the preciseness of the language like I was, or if they didn't care as much as I was. But that was my main contribution to the state of neuro cognitive neuroscience, according to the 2020 textbook, is to remove references to old white men. It seemed appropriate because the founders of the field are, and the people who, who made this happen are a bunch of old white men, and they did a lot, and they contributed a lot, and it just seems weird to kind of call them out. It seems a little awkward. So thanks for checking out this. Hit the subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like, hit all the things, and I'll talk to you later.